Hold on to those afterburners, Fire Nation. A JLD here, and welcome to episode 1671 of EO Fire, where I chat with today's most inspiring entrepreneurs seven days a week. Check out our free podcasting course so that you can create, grow, and monetize your podcast over at freepodcastcourse.com. And now we're chatting with our featured guest, Mr. Daniel DiPiazza. Daniel, are you prepared to ignite? I'm ready to ignite, John. Yes. Daniel is a freedom fighter, jujitsu lover, burrito enthusiast, entrepreneur, and on this rare occasion, author of the brand new classic book, Rich 20 Something, available now. Daniel, take a minute, fill in any gaps from that intro, and give us a little glimpse of your personal life. I don't think that you elucidated for your listeners how good looking I am. Elucidated. That's a word I don't yeah. use often, but <laughs> let me elucidate. DD is incredibly good looking Fire Nation. <laughs> I, fe- I fed that to you. That was an easy layup. <laughs> that was an easy layup. Still going to swing the bat though and knock it out of the park, which I did totally. and fill in some gaps from that intro. For anyone who's followed my story or who actually heard my original interview on EO Fire a few years ago. This all started by me getting fed up at a restaurant job and figuring out, you know what, I need to, I need to find out what this whole making money thing is. What, what is this, what is this kind of, what is this whole entrepreneurship thing? How can I get involved in this area of life that seems to be just blossoming in, in the internet community and the startup community? And I pulled myself off my bootstraps and, you know, there's, there's a longer story to it, but the idea is first understanding that's possible, you know? Well, there is a longer story, and what's good is that you were, as you alluded to, I like we're using alluded, elucidate, um, <laughs> episode 1008 of EO Fire. So just about 1,660 episodes ago, you graced us with your incredibly good-looking presence, and all was well in the world. In Fire Nation, he talked about his worst entrepreneurial moment. He talked about his aha moment. He mentioned the greatest lessons learned throughout XYZ, ABC. But today we're going to talk about a couple things that are different because, again, it's been a while since we've chatted. Some things have happened. Again, your your new book, Rich 20-something, which came out in early May. And as as we're talking, um, or as this has been released, it's May 19th. So this is live. This is available for you, Fire Nation, to go check out. So if you want to be Rich 20-something or if you are Rich 20-something and you want to figure out what the next step is, this, this book is for you. And we'll talk more about that later. But basically... You've got a couple areas of expertise, Didi, because you know you love jujitsu. You're an entrepreneur. You're a freedom fighter. What would you say if you could narrow it down to one? Is that Uno area of expertise? The most interesting thing that's helped me the most is being able to network and connect with people. Um, as I make it up the ranks, I, I kind of see entrepreneurship almost like high school. You start off as a freshman and you kind of make your way up. Um, as you, as you move up the ranks, you realize more and more how important it is to be able to have people along your journey help you. And to do that, you need to, you need to know how to, how to connect with people. And it doesn't mean that you need to be an, an extrovert. There are plenty of introverts and people who just enjoy their alone time on this journey as well. But the idea that you can genuinely connect with others and be able to, be able to find a common ground so that when you need something that can help you, that's been invaluable to me. You're the expert here. What do we do wrong in this area? I was talking to this earlier with someone who was interviewing me earlier today, and I think- I I don't want your repeated (laughs) hash from some other (laughs) podcast interview. Give me something original. Okay. Before you roast me, before you open roast me, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Before you open roast me, okay? The reason why why I brought that up is because it's been on my mind a lot, because it's so important. Let me tell you a little story. When I came to Los Angeles in 2013, I didn't know anybody. I only knew one person, and it's a mutual friend of mine of ours, Jordan from Art of Charm. I knew just Jordan and he was the only connection I had in the city. And so I have a, a sushi lunch with, with, with Jordan and we get to talking and I eventually ask him at the end of our meal, I say, hey, listen, um, who else do you know that might be uh, someone worth talking to? Who else do you know that might be someone that I could connect with? And so he connected me with a few of his friends. And as I look back on kind of the chain of the chain of connections over these past few years, I can see that everyone that's helped me along the way has come from that one connection. Um, And as I think about kind of my life as a whole now, I realize that there's not much that I've done by myself. And so I've taken a lot of interest in cultivating the ability to network with people, which means that um, I'm constantly reading a lot of books on how to be a better speaker, on how to meet people who are influential. And I make that a central part of my life. And so it's not just about uh, making money. It's about making friendships. 
And that along the way has been a, has been a big payoff for me. So my initial chain and my chain reaction uh, connection that's become my success story is, is Jamie Tardy, who's now Jamie Masters, who is my yeah. first ever mentor back in 2012 when I was clueless about podcasting. And she took me under her wing. She introduced me to people. Well, she first she made me go to a conference that I didn't even want to go to. Then she introduced me to Pat Flynn, Michael Stelzner, Cliff Ravenscraft, people who have all become friends now in my life. And that all came from that first initial chain connection of me hiring Jamie as my mentor. And everything from that has come from that initial connection. I remember meeting Amy Porterfield and being like, wow, this, that's Amy. And then, you know, shooting Amy an email like a couple of weeks later, her being like, oh, yeah, you're the dude that Jamie introduced me to. Like, of course, I'll be on your show because of Jamie. Like, that was it. Like, that was that chain that started it all. So Fire Nation, like, take from this that it can start with one. And a lot of times it does start with one. So... Didi, let's kind of shift a little bit right now because, you know, again, you were on episode 1008. Uh, you told a few stories, but what's been going on since then? It's been a couple of years. What's been the worst moment that you've experienced in the last couple of years? I mean, maybe it's not devastating. Maybe it is. I don't know. But take us to the worst one and let's talk about it a little bit. Do you want to go real or do you want to go, do you want to go McDonald's? I want to go real as long as we're talking about business. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, 2016 last year in uh, the middle of the year, my grandmother died and mm. it sent me on a, a big spiral in terms of just being really depressed. And I, I learned kind of a few things, both personal and professional. The first thing is, um, Personally, I think that no one really talks about in entrepreneurship, no one really talks about like down personal moments affecting business. Everyone, especially in the entrepreneurship community, in in you know, this whole this bubble that's been created by all these online entrepreneurs, no one ever really talks about hard personal stuff. People only talk about the good stuff. And I think it's important to make sure that we remember that we're all humans here and talk about things that are going on with us, especially if we have personal brands like you do and like I do. Mm. Um People need to see that that their heroes and their idols are going through the same struggles uh, that that they are because that makes the business more relatable. That makes the person more relatable. And although it's it's definitely not a sales push, there's not it's I you know I'm not trying to profit from like this horrible thing that happened to me. I think it's made me more relatable talking about that stuff. And on the business side of that, one thing that's really been apparent to me or was apparent to me at the time was when I was going through this really rough time and this really uh, depressed time. Um. I realized that my systems were more important than ever because I, I didn't want to be around the work as much. So, you know, we have a team now and we're all, we're located in Santa Monica and yeah, we'll do webinars and we do email stuff and uh, we have courses and we do seminars and we have a book now and all those things um, at one point needed me. I was the main person, the main driver and the main thing that person that got things done. But as I retreated into more of a, you know, secluded space so I could heal myself and kind of lick my wounds, I realized, man, if I'm going to make this retreat, the systems need to be tight so that I don't need to be involved all the time. And so uh, of from that really negative space came the positive aspect of tightening up the workflow. And you have, you're a great example of systems, right? I mean, you're tight. Um, and that's, that's something that I had to learn to do. So I'm glad you brought this up, this kind of the darker side of entrepreneurial world, because, you know, again, a lot of times it's just all unicorns and rainbows. And we talk about the big six figure and seven figure launches and this and that. And it's good to focus on the successes so you can learn from them and do all these things. But we have to realize that entrepreneurs are humans too. Things are going to happen in our lives. I mean, what happened with you and your grandmother that sent you in, that sent you in that spiral? You know, one thing that Gary Vee talks about all the time is that, you know, there's a reality out there of startup founders committing suicide. And like nobody wants to talk about it because that's not yeah. fun to talk about. But, you know, we, we paint this unbelievably rosy, beautiful picture that you launch an app and then you get millions of dollars in funding and then you sell it for billions and you know then like you're on your way to the moon like of course or you know if you're Elon Musk you know on your way to Mars whatever it might be and <laughs> that's just the reality for some people but for a lot of people you do a startup and you run out of money and you have to sheepishly mm -hmm. go back to the people that maybe did that friends and family round and I mean that's probably where a lot of you know these startup founders are really getting super down to the fact that some of them you know have even committed suicide where you know, they used their family money because, you know, the family has heard, oh, yeah, I remember Mark Zuckerberg did the family and friends round. And now all of his family and friends are, you know, hundreds of millions of millions of heirs. So, you know, they have this yep. big expectation. And when it doesn't happen, you go back and you say, I, I lost all your money. That's, that's devastating. But 
that's why we have to talk about the good and the bad. So I'm glad you brought that up. And that's why for 1600 plus episodes, I've been talking about the worst entrepreneurial moments at the beginning of every show. Because I want my listeners to know that even the most successful entrepreneurs in the world have had devastating, heart-wrenching, horrible, terrible failures in their life. But guess what? they bounce back from them and they've come back and I've had a bunch of interviews and people like yourself, Daniel, who I interviewed a couple years ago who were crushing it. And then I interviewed them two years later and they had a huge, horrible disaster in between that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, then then we could talk about that too. Now, what I kind of want to move into is an aha moment that you've had recently. Now you just talked about a great one where you knew that you had to pull yourself out as the main functioner of everything in your business. Um, That's great to create those systems and automations, but what's one of the greatest ideas you've had over the past few years and how have you implemented that to turn it into success? That's a really good one, man. And I think it's come um, not necessarily with age maturity, but entrepreneurial maturity. I feel like, you know, I feel like I've hit my, my entrepreneurial puberty. Um, You know, I turned 28 last year and I feel like, I feel like at 28, um, I feel like I was a takeover CEO. You know, you hear these stories of CEOs that come into a business and they say, oh, sh-, you know, like, look, what, what, what's, what's been, what's happened here? What, I don't know if this is a family friendly. What, it is. So good catch. You know, yeah. Good catch. <laughs> you know, what's, what's, what's going on with this business? It's on fire, you know, yes. and not in a good way. It's, oh, no, you know, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's on fire. It's inflamed. You know, they take over for a, for a, a poor, a poor CEO and this new one has to turn it around. And in many ways, that's what I felt like. And not because the business was necessarily suffering and doing horrible, but because I came to the realization that, man, you know, I was focused on so many things that the company itself was pretty much straddled amongst, you know, 10 different ideas, all of which were really important to me and near and dear to me. And none of which I had the, the fortitude at one point to like to cast aside because I, they were all something that I had some sort of ownership in, some sort of um, connection to. And I realized, man, if I want this business to be successful, I have to really become focused on the one or you know, maybe even two drivers that are going to make this make this thing work. And so kind of like similar to to jobs when he when he killed the what the the, the Apple Newton, right? It was this, yeah. like this handheld, this palm handheld device. He killed it. Um, and I had to kill a bunch of different projects. Uh, there were some, there were some courses that we were running that we just didn't think all the way through. And so there were like a lot of technical things that we didn't understand and we forced them through and they were causing our business to bleed. And so I came through in the middle of 2016 and we just put everything on a chopping block and we, we killed a ton of projects. And what ended up happening was we got a lot more from doing a lot less. And I thought that, I thought that the idea of skin, and this includes people, by the way, we fired some people and not, not in a, like. No, not with prejudice, but just like, you know, we had to let some people go. We shrunk back down, you know, because we, we had a lot of success in 14 and 15 and we're like, yeah, this is perfect. Everything is going great. So we got all these products going and we got these, we hired this whole staff and then I realized, man, you know, sometimes it's much better to focus on a few small things and really nail it than try to have 10 things that you go a mile wide and inch deep. You know what I mean? Good is the enemy of great. And mm-hmm. sometimes you have to give up the good to get to the great. And if you're doing a lot of things, you can only be good at a lot of things. You can't be great at everything because if your resources are being tapped and being uh, just spread out across of all these things, and like you said, they're the NDD, if you try to go a mile wide, you can only go an inch deep. You're not making much of an impact. But if instead you just focus and say, hey, I'm going one inch wide and one mile deep, guess what? You're going to crush it. You're going to go all the way, dominate that niche. And just make a mark that way. So sometimes you got to give up the good to get to the great. And usually that is the case. Now, moving forward to today, because you got some cool things going on. What is the thing that has you most fired up? What gets you out of bed in the morning on fire? Man, I got a book coming out. It's already out, by the way. It's already out, by the way. And the cool thing about this book and the thing I like about it the most from from a selfish perspective is that it's both... It's both actionable and also chronological because it, it basically chronicles the way that my life has evolved and how the business has evolved around that and all the takeaways along the way with exact steps that you can do to follow the same path. The cool thing is that I know when I'm 90, I'll be able to look back on it and I'll be able to remember <laughs> some things that I would have forgotten. Rich 20 something. Where did that title come from and what does it mean? Title came from me being frustrated um, in my apartment in my boxers in Atlanta you know, five years ago, but that that ended up becoming the name of my brand. And to me, I think it means a few things. So let me ask you a question, JLG. Uh, You know what ROI is, right? Yes. Return on investment. Right. But what about ROT? You know what that is? 
Return on time. Return, well, maybe, close enough. Return on 20s. Ooh, even better. At Rich 20-something, we focus on helping you get the biggest bang for your buck in this very critical, we think, 10-year period of your life. Anywhere from 18 to 30, we think, is a, is a crucial period because this is the time when a lot of people are trying to figure out what they want to do. And in that time period, we waste a lot of this critical um, this critical energy, almost this this capital that we could reinvest into ourselves to make our 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond a lot better. So the, the focus of the book is helping you to get your life together a lot sooner when you're younger so that all those benefits come back to you many fold when you're older. And it doesn't mean that the book doesn't apply to people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. But what we're really focused on is helping young people figure out how to get from where they are to where they want to be faster and reap a really big return on that investment that they're going to put in. Can I give you some live on-air guidance that you can totally ignore? Please do. <laughs> so I love the title of your book, like Rich 20-something. I think that the 20s are the time to figure things out, to try things, to fail, and to qu become quote-unquote rich. Now, what I've realized being a 30-something, is that it's a lot easier to become rich than it is to become wealthy. And this mm -hmm. is actually why Tony Robbins has come out with these two recent books about making money and all this stuff and The Unshakable. So I think that you've written the right book for you at the right time. And you said you're 28, so you're almost in your 30s now. Mm -hmm. I kind of think your next book is Wealthy 30-something. To me, that's the next step for you. So you write this rich 20 something about how to actually generate the wealth and get and get the money because you need the money. You can't be wealthy without getting rich first. But now how do you become wealthy in your 30s after you become rich in your 20s? I would go grab that domain. I would lock down that book title and uh, there it's my gift to you, brother. Honestly, John, I was I was preparing to say I was preparing to like nod and smile and say good one and like not do whatever <laughs> you're going to say. Um, no, because, you know, because a lot of people totally like, you know, want some business advice. I'm like, eh, listen, you know, I need advice like I need a hole in the head, buddy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. like uh, Honestly, that's a really good idea. I love it. I really do. It's just the transition, you know, is you're getting older. You know, and as you're realizing what it means to become, you know, wealthy from being rich, I love it. So I'm looking forward to it. And I promise if you do publish that book, I'll have you back on EOFire. That's amazing. And honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'm so surprised. That's the only piece of advice I've gotten recently that I didn't cringe afterwards. <laughs> Seriously, man. Okay, I'm going to take that and I'm going to hold that close to my heart. Non-cringeworthy yeah. advice. If that's what I get, hold that's it. what I'll take. So Fire Nation, we're going to be dropping some more value bombs in the lightning round. So don't you go anywhere. We're going to thank our sponsors. Feel like you're in a crowded market? Entrepreneurs worldwide know that exact same feeling. But what if you could grow your top line with new customers by looking outside of the United States? If you're looking for an untapped version of Amazon or Google to help you connect with a worldwide marketplace, then look no further than Alibaba. Alibaba is an e-commerce platform where you can buy and sell anything. Alibaba is even hosting a two-day conference in Detroit called Gateway 17 on June 20th and 21st, where you'll learn how to capitalize on the fastest growing consumer market in the world, meet experts like Jack Ma, build relationships, and learn from companies who are already in China. Availability is limited, and I've secured an amazing offer. Save up to 50% on your registration fee by visiting gateway17.com and entering code FIRE. This is a great growth opportunity for businesses and entrepreneurs alike, so be sure to visit gateway17.com and enter code FIRE when you reserve your spot today. That's G-A-T-E-W-A-Y 17.com code FIRE. I know that you have a mission that you want to share with the world, but let's be real. It can be tough to focus on that mission when you're bogged down in the day-to-day -day operations of your business. So don't let those things dominate your time. There's software that can help you find tools to control the day-to-day -day busy work, and it's called Cap. Terra. Capterra is an easy to use website with over 400 categories of software to choose from. It not only helps you find the best software solutions for your business needs, including website building, customer service, and project management tools. They also have thousands of ratings and reviews from actual software users just like you. And the best part, using Capterra is absolutely free. Join the millions of people who use Capterra every month to make the right software decision. Visit capterra.com slash fire and find the software that will help you do what you do better. That's Capterra, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot -E com slash fire. Didi, we are back. Are you ready to rock the lightning rounds? 
I'm ready to rock it. Yes. What was holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Fear of looking stupid. What's the best advice you've ever received? If it's not an absolute yes, it's an absolute no. What's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Extremely early rising, 430. Can you share an internet resource like Evernote with Fire Nation? Have you heard of Clearbit? Never. Okay, so it's this plugin for Gmail. And what it does is it allows you to, um, to look up contacts at any, at any company or domain. So you can type in bestbuy.com and it will have the CEO of Best Buy's email address right in the tool. <laughs> if you could recommend one book to, of course, join Rich 20-something on our bookshelves, what would it be and why? I'm going to have to go with Scaling Up for an Harnish. And why? I think that as Rich 20-something mirrors my, my kind of journey into entrepreneurship and scaling up, uh, Vern's book does a really great job of expounding upon what happens once you scale up. Daniel, let's end today on Fire Brother with you giving us a parting piece of guidance, the best way that we can connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. Something that people overlook a lot in the journey is the, the aspect of patience. Um, there's, this, there's this idea, especially because of I mean, partially because of people like us. I mean, and, and yeah. John, you're producing podcasts all the time and there's so much content going out there and it gives this, this effect and this illusion that, um, that if we want something and we just put in the work, it's going to happen immediately. So but, I'm part of the problem. That's what you're saying. You're part of the problem. <laughs> but, 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 but the reality of the situation is sometimes you'll put in a lot of work and you're not going to see the results immediately. And what's required in that gap between Doing the work and seeing the results is patience, and most people give up in that gap. Um, Ira Glass has a very interesting quote on this, um, which I'm going to paraphrase. You know, but basically, his his idea is that um, creatives and and artists come into their work because they have a great sense of taste, and in the beginning, their sense of taste never really matches with the artistic output that they're able to offer to the world. And they're always frustrated because they have this idea of what they want to do in their head, but they're never able to see that idea through to realization because uh, they, they don't have the patience to keep doing the creative work. And so with patience and then prolific work, you're going to see that result. And you've done a great job of that. I mean, you know, we're on episode 2000 plus of EO Fire and it just keeps going. You know? Just keeps going. And I love that word patience. I actually theme my years with one word. In 2017, my one word is think because I really want to make sure that I just take a step back and think before I act or think before I commit. I just want to really just think and do some really deep thinking. Um, I can definitely see where patience will be a word of mine in, in an upcoming year. And I really wish it had been a word of mine back in 2012 or 2013, because that's really when I needed it, uh, when I struggled. So patience, Fire Nation, totally. have the patience. And best way to connect with you. I'm Rich 20-something on every social channel. And if you want to check out the new book, which I hope you do, it's rich27.com slash book. Fire Nation, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You've been hanging out with DDP and JLD today, so keep up the heat. And head over to eofire.com, type Daniel in the search bar. Not only will this show notes page pop up, but his most recent episode on EOFire, 1008, will pop up as well. So check out both of those because he shares some really cool stories in that episode as well. These are the best show notes in the biz, timestamps, links galore, and of course, rich20something.com slash book is where you can head over there and learn more about that. Daniel, thank you for sharing your journey with Fire Nation today. For that, we salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you so much, brother. Hey, Fire Nation. Hope you enjoyed our chat with Daniel today. And if you are ready to create your dream life one step at a time, you can just check out my book, howtofinallywin.com. I will catch you there or I'll catch you on the flip side.